The Tom Woods Show, episode 1917. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, if you've decided it's best not to have your kids educated by people who have declared war on you, then consider the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. Instructors like me will give your kids an unfair advantage and an education you and I could only have dreamed of. But make sure you join through my link because only there do you get my $160 worth of free bonuses. My link is ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. Well, today I'm sharing with you an episode of another podcast on which I was a guest not too long ago, and that is The Delling Pod, which is James Dellingpole's podcast. You may recall not too long ago, I had James Dellingpole as a guest, and I just love that guy. So this is my episode with him, and you're just going to love it because he's so great. <laughs> I, just, I just love this guy. Now, normally, when I share with you an appearance I've made on another show, we remove extraneous material like the person introducing me. I mean, you more or less know who I am or the opening music for that podcast. But let me tell you something. I love the opening music for the James Dellingpole podcast. Okay, you just, so you have to hear it. So I'm leaving it in. So like it or not, here we go. Welcome to the Delling Pod with me, James Delling Pod. And I know I always say I'm excited about this week's special guest, but I am actually. I've got some real high grade guestage here today, none other than Tom Woods. Tom, welcome to the Delling Pod. James, it's wonderful to be on a podcast that I can actually stand to listen to. So it's great. Oh, that's good. That's really nice. No, I'm flattered because there's a kind of hierarchy, I think, in pods. Like, you know, who are those really big guys that I've, whose names have just eluded me, the biggest podcasters in America? Well, like Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. Shows and, like that. And who's the other famous one, the really famous one? Uh, Dave Rubin has a huge yeah, show. Dave Rubin. Okay. So those two. So they'd be the bosses, wouldn't they? So if you get on their, on their podcasts, you've, you've made it. And I would sort of never dare ask, ask them to come on mine. But you, you asked me to come on your podcast before you came on. You, you, you were happy to come on mine, which I think was really nice. I felt like, like I'd been really flattered. Oh, no, look, for heaven's sake, I, I honestly think you have one of the best podcasts out there. I love what you have to say. I love that you're absolutely fearless. I mean, you honestly do not care. You just express your opinions. No. I know it's bad, isn't it? I mean, imagine being married to me or having me as your father. Because I can tell you, my my family don't like it at all. I mean, no man is a hero to his valet, and I'm sure it's the same to, to wives and wives and children. But it's like when I go on the march in 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 London, when I when I I go to kind of to protest against lockdowns and stuff or whatever, I get high fives in the street. People love me. You know, it's like it's like being a rock star. And then I get home and it's like being a turd that the dog left on the, on the bathroom floor or something where it wasn't meant to, you know, that kind of thing. That's, that's the difference in with my people versus with my family. Well, my two younger daughters are only now starting to figure out that their dad has a certain notoriety. Mm. So they're still computing that a bit. And actually my favorite memory so far involving them and my notoriety, such as it is, is that when I, had the thousandth episode of the Tom Woods show. I did a big live event in Orlando, Florida in person. Yeah. And we had a, a huge audience for that. And part of it was part of the event involved a roast of me. And unbeknownst to me, my four older daughters had prepared their own roast of their dad. I did not know about this in advance. They wrote their own jokes. No adult wrote them for them. And they came up on stage and absolutely stole the show. My now 11-year-old was only seven then, and she was just devastating in her. I mean, basically, she was joking primarily about my height because I'm not the tallest fellow out there. How tall are you? I'm 5'6". Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm 5'8". And unfortunately, you and I have both been cursed 
by the fact that since we were born, the sort of the, the subsequent generations seem to have got taller, don't they? I mean, when I was when I was born, probably five foot eight would have been quite a, a reasonable height. But now I'm a complete short ass, and I'm sure it's the same in, in in America, where everyone is 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 tall, aren't they? I mean, they all play. You all play American football and things, and you're all huge. Yeah, and basketball and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. But. If that's the worst they can say about me, but it turns out it's not the worst they can say about me. <laughs> They've said much worse. What What is that thing, by the way? I don't think we have roasting in the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware of the roasting tradition. I've seen it on, what is it? Isn't there a thing, does the president get roasted in that that White House dinner or is that, am I making that up? There, there may, well, what we have had is a comedian, a stand-up comedian attends and usually uh, roasts a lot of the politicians in the audience, including the president. Yeah. But in a traditional roast, the object of the roast then goes to the podium and roasts everybody right back. Right. Yeah. 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 Where does that come from? The, the, uh, honestly, the, I don't know. I mean, it's been going on for, I mean, it was made famous, I think, in the U.S. by Dean Martin because there were famous roasts involving him. But so, so, yeah, at my event, the idea was that every single person who came up to roast me mm. also had to roast the other they, – they roasting the other roasters and me. They roasted every, – everybody's roasting everybody. Mm. And then it's my turn to, to show up there and just devastate everybody. I was not really up to that task. I had, I had a professional comedian roasting me. Yeah. It seems like it was not a fair fight. But honestly, though, I like the tradition because all the, the barbs that you're getting are all given – by people who obviously hold you in high regard, they're 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 given affectionately. Yes, uh, it's it's actually a very sweet tradition. Yeah, yeah, you know it is. Also, I I would imagine that you're quite crap at. I mean, you seem you seem very nice. Now, uh, maybe that's just your persona that comes apo- across in your podcast, but you seem you seem very sweet, which wouldn't necessarily go with with a short person. You know, you should be full of bitterness and um, and you know, <laughs> suppressed rage and stuff. But is that, is, that, is that an act or are you actually like that in, in real life? Yeah, I'm not, it's not really a persona on my show. The only right. way that it, it, it's a persona is that I, I watch my language on the show because I don't want little Johnny who's six learning new vocabulary words from old woods here. I would feel bad about that. And I want my pot, I mean, as it is, I'm appealing to a, a, a niche audience. I already have a limited number of people who would ever be interested, and I don't want to alienate them further yeah. by having them think they can't listen to the Tom Wood show in the car. Uh, so I, I, you know, maybe I'll, I'll let a, a bad word go here and there in real life, but otherwise, it, it really is the real me. I mean, I, I'm you know, oddly enough fairly cheerful and pleasant in the yeah. midst of uh, you know the apocalypse. Well, we'll move on to the apocalypse in a moment, but I, I just wanted to have this kind of you know, fellow podcaster bants come, because I'm, I'm actually genuinely interested in, in this kind of stuff. Um, Me too. The, um, you know, talking shop. My natural, my default mode is is potty mouth. I, I, I really find it hard not to not to swear. And occasionally I'm brought up sh- short by people who've, who've written to me, and mostly in a, a very nice way, and they've said exactly this. They said, my, you've been red-pilling my children. But the other day I was driving along in the car and they were just loving your show. And then suddenly you started dropping all these F-bombs. And for me, you know, F-bombs are really like punctuation, nothing more than that, a bit of color. But I can see that if I heard somebody else, well, say, say, well, I haven't got young children, but if I did have young children and they're listening to Tom Woods and he suddenly started cussing, I might feel that that wasn't his job in front of my children. So it's... Uh, one has to remember these things. You're absolutely right. Well, uh, from time to time, just to to emphasize this, if I do say a bad word, we bleep it out on my own show. Mm. Or, or, or even once I had a comedian on who was known for having an absolutely filthy mouth. And I begin the episode by assuring everybody that he's going to be on his best behavior, yeah. not to worry. And then I welcome him on the show. And the very first thing he says is Tom Woods, how the blankety blank are you? <laughs> First thing out of his mouth. Well, I think people would have been disappointed if he if he hadn't done that, wouldn't they? Right. I mean, that's 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 part of the deal. And do you do you find um do, do you get stuck? Do you have to do you make your own lists of of, of your dream guests, or do you find that it all just kind of you, you've got an abundance of? 
Well, I'll there are it. some people I'd like to get who I think are just beyond my reach oh, because who? I'm too small of a potato. You know, like I'm a I'm a moderate size potato, but I, I'm not. Well, how many have you I, got? Hang on, wait, wait a second. You're you're quite you're quite. I mean, if you were a, 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 a baked potato, you'd probably be too big for. Me. I don't like my baked potatoes too big. I don't if I don't like baked potatoes at all, really. But if I if, if I see them in front of me, I'd go for quite a small one. You you seem quite a big one. Well, I think it may be because I have so many different platforms. I mean, I've like you, I'm an author. I've written a number of books. Yeah. A couple of them have been big bestsellers. I have a secret to tell you about one of my books. We'll, I'll tell you off the air. Okay. But in terms of my, like, I have a mailing list that's kind of notorious, and I've got 80,000 names on it. And it's very hard to build that's an email list to get to have that many names. Very hard. Nobody wants to give up his email address to some schmo. No. But somehow I've managed to do it. So I have that. And then I, you know, I also, I have, I have two mailing lists. I have that one. I have one about uh, entrepreneurship. I have the podcast. I have a YouTube channel. And so it, ju- I just seem omnipresent. <laughs> to yeah. Me. Yeah. You do. Well, and, and you haven't got any other employers, have you? It's just, this is just, you, you're a one man show. Oh, it's just me. Yeah. I don't, doesn't matter. No one can fire me. It's the only, the only way to be blood. It really is. I, 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 yeah, I, in I mean, this day and age, and I'll say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do have some sponsors, but if I lost all the sponsors, it wouldn't affect me at all. I mean, I would be a little unhappy, but I've built up enough income streams that if one of them drops or two or three, I'm still okay. It's yeah. taken me a long time to get to this point. But now that I'm here, I realize I'm glad I've been working on this and I'm glad I'm not in academia anymore. I'm glad I, I'm not at the mercy of some boss looking over my Twitter feed. I'm glad I can just be all woods here. How long, well, academia, how long are you in academia for? Well, I was just, I taught at a two-year college for about seven years. I, I taught there at first in New York. Yeah. I taught there at first because I thought, well, I'll teach here because the salary is really great and I get a good travel allowance. I like to go to conferences yeah. and I, I get to teach survey courses, which I enjoy rather than super specific courses. And I'll, I'll work here until I pay off my student loans and then I'll go find a, a better job. Mm-hmm. So after I did that, I actually got an offer to, to be in residence at the, at the Mises Institute, where I would earn about the same, except the job description was, work on whatever you want. We, we support you, so you just work on whatever you want. I thought I'd be crazy not to take that deal. Hmm. And so while I was down there, I think I put out a book a year, and I would have been ashamed of myself if I had My whole job is work on what makes you happy. If I wasn't churning out books, that would have been an injustice to them. And could you keep the, the, the royalties or whatever from the book or did you? Or- yes. Isn't that an, it's incredible. I could work on whatever I wanted and, and get, keep the extra income. Now I've been pretty good about promoting the Mises Institute as much as possible and being a good spokesman and ambassador for them. Hmm. But, but they've also been great to me. They, they sound great. I, I have to say, I tell, you, I tell you who I've really gone off re- recently. I mean, this is going to kill my chance of ever getting a fellowship with them, but I think actually that was never going to happen anyway. Cato, they kind of suck, don't they? What are they? What are they doing? <laughs> what are they you know, doing? I, they have been so. Know, they have. Sucked. I'll say this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, they have. There are some. There's a handful of decent people there, which is m- more than I think they'd be willing to. Oh say. Oh no, I love Pat Michaels. Here's what I, I love some of them, but mm-hmm. but but it's the actual. Yeah. Oh yeah yeah yeah. But but, but the overall direction, the general tenor that you get from them. Yeah. Uh, it 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 very much is of the vibe of. We want some kind of mainstream respectability in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And so that means we're going to write these, uh, these policy papers, and we'll pretend to our donors that these policy papers are making any difference, but they're all going in the trash, of course. And the, the, I guess it's the executive vice president. I don't know exactly what his role is, but he's one of the top people. David Bowes, B-O-A-Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this guy is such a clown. So he's told everybody at Cato that they are not allowed – to, to refer to me, interact with me, even like one of my tweets, not retweet it, James, that would be right. outrageous. But they can't even like a Tom Woods tweet because I used to host a cruise. I was actually able to make a cruise profitable but with libertarians, and it was a ton of fun. And, and people were told at Cato in no uncertain terms, you are not allowed to go on the Tom Woods cruise. I mean, absolute absurdity. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't want to have a blankety blank measuring contest with this guy. But let's just say I've contributed a lot more to the libertarian world than he has yeah. in terms of books and output. And when I go speak, I, I fill the place. 
Nobody in his right mind even crosses the street to hear David Bowes speak. But man, have they spent their time coming after me. When, when we had the financial crisis of 2008, I wrote a New York Times bestseller explaining why it was not quote unquote capitalism that had caused this. Yeah. Well, what were they doing? I, heaven knows what. I don't know, probably having the Fed chairman over for cocktails. I don't know what's going on with them, but it's not my style at all. Excellent. Now, that you see, there you are. You've no more missed the nice guy. Um, <laughs> That's right. No, the thing is, uh, the, the problem about, about not preparing things is that because because I was just I, I knew I could just it's with you, especially I could just free will where yeah. I want to. And there's so sure. much stuff I want to deal with. And that would have segued neatly into one of my observations about this alleged coronavirus crisis, which is that almost no group of individuals have disappointed me more outrageously than libertarians. I agree so intensely with that. Yeah. And in the UK, it has not been good from what I know. The, the think tanks. I mean, all those people who, who said, I, I've only discovered this recently. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've had, I've done a kind of a, a doctoral study in the rabbit hole in the space of 18 months. I think normally it takes 10 years, probably. But I've done it in 18 months or maybe even 12 months. And um, one of the things I've discovered is that in terms of the new world order, in, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the sinister overlords who are controlling our lives, the think tanks are, are very much a part of that. But these so-called libertarians, these so, so-called believers in Mises and Hayek suddenly seem to think big government is bloody great when it's locking us down and stuff for no reason. Yeah. Yeah, when it's doing the worst possible thing. And, and the major libertarian organizations in the U.S. have not been particularly good. The Libertarian Party would spend its time on social media talking about civil asset forfeiture or some tone-deaf comment like that, yeah. which, I, you know, I, I know there are problems with civil asset forfeiture. We have to talk about this, but not in 2020. I think we can set that aside for a minute yeah. and talk about the fact that we're all locked. I, you know, I only wish I could be out somewhere where someone could pull me over and seize some of my assets. At least I could be out. You know what I mean? So it's it's been very bad, but it's been great for the smaller libertarian organizations that aren't dependent on the whims of a billionaire donor or who aren't craving respectability to distinguish themselves. The Mises Institute, of course, has been absolutely great, and there are others. But, of course, for a libertarian – and here's the problem. The problem is the blue-pilled libertarian. Now, I don't know. Is that expression blue and red-pilled? Is totally, that known? Totally. Okay. I think everyone who listens, listens to, to my show by now must okay, know. So they all know what that means. All right. So the problem we have among a lot of libertarians is that they're basically blue-pilled. Like their view is that – you know, maybe the maybe the government is a little bit off the rails, but, you know, it means well and it's made up of mostly decent people who just want what's best for the country and all this and that. They they honestly think that you know their role is to advise people who might be willing to listen to reason. And 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 what what follows from that is they also believe in the so-called experts that the regime trots out. So if somebody like me comes along and says, Dr. Fauci is obviously a quack. Yeah. who contradicts himself all the time and who can't, for some reason, can't seem to balance in his mind concern over COVID with every other concern a living human being might have. This is a problem. That embarrasses the blue-pilled libertarians because that makes me a conspiracy theorist. No, no, no. It, they would die a thousand deaths before contradicting or showing disrespect toward a Dr. Fauci. Yes. The, the, they... They latch on to things like that. They're embarrassed by libertarians like me. And so for them to speak up against lockdowns, it's a metaphysical impossibility. The lockdowns are recommended by all these institutions and individuals that they also admire. So, yeah, so they'll still write little articles about why price controls lead to shortages and a whole lot of other irrelevant stuff yeah. that doesn't matter at all. But when it really comes down to it, when was the last time – let's say the Cato Institute. I'm just going to name names. Why not? It doesn't benefit me not to name names. When was the last time they took a position on some major thing that the New York Times would legitimately despise them for? <laughs> yes, it's so I don't true. think ever. You know, and whereas, whereas I take positions all the time that I would be despised for because I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't. Yeah, that, that is surely the only, if I used to call myself a libertarian, although more of a sort of, 
more as an adjective than as a noun. You know, I, I have libertarian tendencies, or I used to say I'm a South Park, Park conservative. Or these labels are, are, are kind of awkward, aren't they? Because if you mention the libertarian world, people start playing the more libertarian than thou game. They start saying, "What? So you don't want to have heroin dealers outside school gates? You, what's your problem with the free market and this kind of thing?" But but yeah, generally, I think that this last eighteen months has stopped me ever calling myself a libertarian again. I mean, I think you're the last libertarian that I probably have any respect for, for that reason. <laughs> but the problem, though, is that a lot of conservatives did not exactly distinguish themselves very well in the United States over this either. We have so-called Republican governors all over the U.S. who went in for the, the so-called mitigation measures that were completely useless, and they kept their populations locked up on the basis of quote-unquote science – uh, we have a, a real dearth of people who were willing to stand up. In fact, I just had on my show somebody I think has a very decent shot of being elected to the U.S. Congress next year, who is currently in the Florida State Legislature, Anthony Sabatini. Now, he was even more anti-lockdown than Governor Ron DeSantis. Yes. And he has been consistent and outspoken and outstanding on this. And he told me that the establishment of the Republican Party just couldn't stand the sight of him. So you know, it's not like anybody has really distinguished himself that all that well in this. It's a it's a handful of disorganized, demoralized people like you and me who have been holding the flag aloft. Yeah, yeah, it really has come. I wa- I wonder whether America has has been as bad as it has over here. Because I mean, Tom, I'm almost literally the only person in the what conservative media who has stuck it out speaking out against the lockdowns and against the quarantines and against the nonsense. I mean, you know, I'm not literally the only one, but I am one of very, very few. And all the kind of, all the the feisty, all, all the sort of outspoken right-wing commentators, they've all fled the field. They've all just given up. They don't want to, they don't want to move beyond the Overton window. And the Overton window doesn't permit them to, to criticise away i don't know how to silence my phone go wife answer quickly by the way that horrible that it's not even for me that horrible ringtone was put there by my children to punish me no (laughs) yes i know exactly who that call is as well oh shut up no good it's gone yeah so (laughs) what are we talking about Oh, yeah. About how lonely it is. Has it been the same for you it, it, in, in the U.S.? Has it been a similar problem? I mean, for it example, has not, it has not. There are a, I could say there's a handful of people I know who have disappointed me on this. Yeah. But by and large, thanks to the Mises Institute and the American Institute for Economic Research, I feel like I'm surrounded. And, and plus, I've met a lot of just individuals, just yeah. ordinary Americans who suddenly became data analysts because the data analysts weren't doing data analysis, you know, so people have just had to step up and I've met some really wonderful people. And of course you and I probably have gotten to know a number of people internationally. There's yes. great Nick Hudson in South Africa and Ivor Cummins in Ireland. And, but, but in the United States, it's true. Um, I've been able to surround myself, certainly with my subscribers and stuff, but also my acquaintances uh, by people who, uh, so, who see through it. All, all you have to do is look at the charts and in fact, I'm going to give out a, a website. I created, because I was sick and tired of looking at these charts that seem to indicate that the what we laughingly call the mitigation measures mm-hmm. don't seem to do anything. Because if, if there are, the, the, one of the first series of charts I ever shared was taken from the state of Tennessee, and there were four bordering counties, and one of them had reduced indoor dining to 25%. And that indoor dining is supposed to be one of the great dangers of this whole thing. Yeah. One of the counties did that. The other ones didn't. We have all four charts. And so I would say, all right, now, if I compare Florida to California, they have a million excuses why that's not valid because they're so different. Okay, all right, then I won't do that. How about that? I'll be a sport. I'll take four counties from exactly the same state. So these people are identical. These people are interchangeable. Show me which one of these four charts is of the place that limited indoor dining to 25% and basically ruined all those businesses. And of course, the answer is they have no idea because the charts all look the same. So what I finally did was I put together both from Europe and the United States a series of charts, and you have to pick out 
like, for example, I'll give you a chart and I'll say, okay, here are all the Midwestern states of the United States, and here are their hospitalization numbers or death numbers depicted on this chart, but I haven't labeled them. Now, one of these states dropped all its state-level restrictions two months ago. Can you pick it out on this chart? Now, of course, it should be sticking out like a sore thumb, right? If, if these mitigation measures were as essential as we've been told, it should be clear and obvious which state is not following them. Mm. But, of course, they're all the same. You can't pick it out. And that's the point of the quiz. You get a zero on the quiz, right? Yeah. If you are if you're going by what Dr. Fauci tells you, you'll get a zero on this quiz. So go have fun taking it. I put it up at COVID charts with an S, COVIDchartsquiz.com. Yeah. And see how you do. I think that's it. I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you're sort of um putting out stuff like that. Because I think that people need these. There's there are so many killer killer metrics i think which which once you're aware of them it completely explodes the the myth the the bullshit that yeah. we're being fed by i mean one of my favorite ones is that if you look at the age adjusted mortality figures for for the for the uk which go back as far as 1942 uh and obviously for which the most recent year is is 2020 um but the last year for which we have full don't die of covid i, I could see you were about to die of covid there um <laughs> and the the deaths for 2020 are about the same as as as, 20, as 2009, and every year preceding 2009, going right back to 1942, the death toll per capita of population, age adjusted for mortality, is higher than this supposed plague year of plague years. Now, what does that tell you? People are not dying in droves. People are it's it's manufactured, and yet amazingly, most of our populations still imagine that this is the big one and they should all be very afraid. I read a poll some time ago. Uh, there, there's been, uh, there have been similar studies in the U.S., but in the U.K. about comparing the likelihood of hospitalization mm. in reality for yeah. COVID and the likelihood of hospitalization in the minds of, of yeah. people in the U.K. And it's, it's like a hundred-fold difference uh, and, and bizarre. Now, in the U.S., we, we still have the i think the the public health establishment is somewhat in retreat right now in the us which is which is a very encouraging thing oh yeah restrictions are being dropped left and right and but there are still those who think that if we have a baseball game with with full attendance that this is going to lead to a massive quote unquote super spreader event and by the way if i go the rest of my life never hearing the word super spreader again it'll be too soon yeah that, that's the biggest midwit word of all and then recently we had uh, the the most heavily attended boxing match, indoor boxing match, seventy three thousand spectators. No, the, nobody checked for vaccination status. There was hardly any masking, and this is all more than the magical two weeks ago. And we were warned, oh well, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. And of course, nothing happened. So I, I personally think that the reason people were warning that Texas better not lift its mask requirement or whatever is not that they're afraid Texas will fail. They're afraid Texas will succeed, yeah. which would lead anybody who isn't still isn't brain dead to ask the question, did any of this do any good? I mean, Texas just got rid of all of it and they're all fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, look, lots of people on this side of the pond are casting around the world uh, as to where they might flee. And a lot of, a lot of the, the stories going around is, look, this is global. We are stuffed. But we do look across at your state, your home state, and we think, oh, what I wouldn't give to live in Florida. Is it, is it paradise right now? The only thing holding us back is that there are some counties where mask wearing is still very widespread. So I live in Osceola County, and I see mostly masked people pretty much everywhere I go. However, mm. there are different parts of Florida where that's not the case. In Naples, Florida, there's very little masking at all. And, and I assume I don't need to point out to you that the health consequences are no different. The health outcomes in these places are no different than from places where they are wearing masks. I was up in the northern part of the state, which is called the Panhandle, and and there I saw more than half the people in the grocery store not wearing masks. More than half the people at the department stores not wearing masks. Basically, nobody wear, you know foolish enough to wear masks outdoors. So there are parts of the state where they've just 
mood, they realize that it makes no, it obviously makes no difference if I wear a mask or not. Like they're, it's, it's so fascinating to me that the people who, who fell for this the, the most are the nominally best educated so-called people. Yes. That the average guy figured out pretty early on, this was a whole lot of nonsense and that whether I do this or that doesn't seem to do anything. We can all see that. Uh, but, but I would say, yeah, the, the fact is that in Florida, I can go to a play. I can go to a, uh, there's a, there's a 19, there's a band from like the seventies and eighties uh, called Foreigner that, that uh, just played in Orlando last week. There's an actual concert they played yeah. in Orlando. So, so that's as close as you can get anywhere to life resuming. And then we get on the Twitter feed of governor DeSantis, he'll be at some big fair or festival with his kids. And they're very, I would say, ostentatiously unmasked. I don't think it's a coincidence that he's taken his picture unmasked. I think that's a sign and a symbol to everybody yeah. that we're not, we're not doing this stuff. Now, now, one thing where he's been beaten by several other governors involves the masking of children. Now, I thought I heard that over on, on your side that they had recently said, we don't need to mask children anymore. We're not going to do that. Uh, he's been a little slower on that, but I, I fear that that's, that that's coming. We've got the much more terrifying prospect of children being injected with this experimental mRNA um, substance. Um, I, 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 I can't call it a vaccine because it's not a vaccine. And yeah, for, for, for a disease to which they have, what, 99.9999999999% immunity, uh, they, they're not going to be injured by it. That, that I find very frightening, which is why I look across at Florida, Texas, South Dakota. I mean, I think it was fantastic that DeSantis introduced this rule where he said that people aren't allowed to the businesses aren't allowed to force people to take vaccines and things like that, didn't he? He's, he's been quite good on that front. He did do that. That's right. Yeah. But on the, on the children thing, what's m even more bizarre about it is that we've noted as this has gone on that schools obviously have not been major sources of spread and school teachers are not faring any worse than any other group. But there, there's a study, I found out about this from uh, Sunitra Gupta at Oxford. There's a study out of Scotland that's rather suggestive, whereby healthcare workers who have a child in the home, they did a study of this, and they found that if they have a child in the home, they're far less likely to have a problem with COVID. And that this effect multiplies along with the number of additional children. So it's almost, not only are children not transmitting it to adults, but if anything, they might even be some kind of a block, or at least according to this yeah. study, so this is very interesting, and yet we're acting like the kids are – because what's happening now in the U.S. in some places is that the adults can take their masks off if they've been vac vaccinated. But since it's impossible for a 7-year-old to have been vaccinated because the vaccine isn't approved for anybody under age 12, they have to keep the masks on as if that 7-year-old kid is going to cause your death. So Florida schools, for example, do, do, they, do, do the kids wear masks or not? Well, what's been happening now is that on a – on a, the basis of one school board or one county after another is uh, generally the consensus has been that in the fall, because uh, my, my kids go to a private school, they don't, they don't, they just make their own decisions. Um, mask wearing will be optional, yeah. which is, which is by the way, all I would ask for at this point. Yeah. And, and I think if, if mask wearing is optional, that means no one's going to wear them. Yeah. You will. You, you, you would certainly hope so. Yeah, definitely. I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but it's some, 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 even kids appear to have become kind of habituated, even addicted to wearing masks. It's just like, it's what you do. There could be some simply because their parents guilt them into it. But by and large, I mean, I, I do talk to some kids because my kids have lots of friends and I, I you know, I, I don't want to be a, a fanatic who does nothing other than talk about COVID, but, but they, they generally can't wait to rip these things off their faces. They can't wait. They hate that's, it. That's good. Look, I've been let me let me go right down the um down the black hole here. Um I am very pessimistic about what's happening in the world. I think that this is that these are the end days that 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 this is the the kind of whatever you want to call them the black nobility the secret the people who secretly control um the world this is they're finally cashing in on their on on what they've been planning for decades if not centuries and that we're seeing this in the 
destruct the, the deliberate destruction of small businesses, their replacement with this kind of corporate technocratic structure where we ordinary folk are treated like cattle. I mean, this is where we're heading, where biosecurity states and so on. How, how far down the rabbit hole with me are you on that? At this point, I honestly don't know what to conclude. Other than I've, what I've started to say is I am never going to criticize so-called conspiracy theorists again. Never. Because at least, first of all, they've been more right than the alleged experts on yeah. almost every front. I mean, let's face it. That's, that's been true. Yeah. And secondly, they're just trying to understand what explanation accounts for this madness around the world that has no rational basis. Yes. I mean, as soon as you start arguing to me that we need to follow these mitigation measures, I just immediately write you off as an idiot at this point. And so what the conspiracy theorists, so-called, are trying to do is say, well, given that we all know that these measures are stupid and pointless and don't accomplish anything – then there has to be something other than our well-being that accounts for the motivation for why they're doing it. And so maybe it's not our well-being, it's theirs. Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't see the flaw in that argument. And, and I don't even necessarily think that it has to involve the, uh, the proverbial smoke-filled room where people are expressly conspiring with one another. But that, that's not even necessary. It can simply be there are people with the libido dominandi who just enjoy this they love being able to tell people, well, we're having another important press conference tomorrow, and then we'll announce that that 35% occupancy is the new rule that's come down from science. Yeah. There are some people who enjoy lording it over others. Yeah. We have this prejudice in our society where we think all the greedy people are in the private sector. You know, we have the Monopoly game board with the, the guy running around, the short guy with the white mustache carrying sacks of money with dollar signs on them. And we think that's where all the greed is and the power hungriness. But it's just it's the same species of people who are in government as in the private sector. And in fact, I think it's the worst of us who wind up there because these are people who take pleasure in lording it over others. And this has been a, a profound um, boon for them. Now, the, the silver lining, this is not really a silver lining, but the, um, the, the one thing that at least makes me slightly happy mm. is the DeSantis phenomenon because – there is an annual conference in the U.S., uh, the Conservative Political Action Conference, CPAC, yeah, yeah. held in February in Washington, D.C. every year, uh, or, or the outskirts of D.C. It's in Maryland, isn't it, actually? I think on the, it's, it's, it's held on the... Yeah, it's, it's somewhere on the... Yeah, I think it's because the idea is they can't actually have it in D.C. Yeah, yeah. for ideological reasons, which is great. But this year, of course, they had, to have, they had it in Florida. And DeSantis came out and gave a rousing speech, yeah. and he was given, naturally enough, a hero's welcome. The week after that happened, Governor Abbott of Texas announced Texas was reopening 100%. My theory is he, re he, he has been, he'd been waffling back and forth for a year. He realized when he watched, saw the reception DeSantis got, you can make political hay out of thumbing your nose at the Dr. Fauci's and yeah. all the lunatics. You can actually make political hay out of it. And I'm not going to let DeSantis get all that hay. I want some hay. And all of a sudden that happened. And then one state after another started doing it. So if they, if they tried to pull this again, they would still probably get away with a good chunk of it. But this time more people want to be the Ron DeSantis, at least in the United yeah. States. Yeah. I, I do worry about Ron DeSantis because I think like, like Bolsonaro, um, like the guy in charge of um, Belarus, was it Lukashenko, is it? Is that his name? Sounds right. Um, yeah, plausible, isn't it? Um, I know I've uh, heard that name. So those guys, but then you've got, then you've got um, John Magafuli, the guy in the, the president of Tanzania, who, who was very principled in his opposition to to this kind of vaccine vaccine tyranny? Didn't want anything to know. He famously tested, I think it was a guava, um, and and the guava came up well, it was a similar fruit came up papaya, maybe it was the papaya came up positive for coronavirus. He was demonstrating that his his scientists were just just spinning a line that it was all nonsense. Anyway, poor old John Magafuli ended up getting offed. He got magafooled, as I call it. You know, he, he, he got, he got Hillaryd. Um, if that, is that the word you use? Hillaryd or, or Clinton or? Oh, I, it seems like that should be a verb. And yet I've never heard it used that. Way. When you, when you, when you die, die entirely accidentally, having, having crossed. <laughs> right. 
Maybe yeah. I'll start using them. It's a yeah. good one. Well, so 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 poor old Magafuli um, went, and I I look big farmer has a you don't want to cross big farmer. I mean, obviously, I love Big Pharma. I totally respect it, which is why I'm not going to get get killed by it. But you can see why somebody like why somebody like um, DeSantis might be playing with fire. And I just wonder. Look, it seems to me at the moment that the, the battle for Western civilization is taking place between states like South Dakota, Florida, and Texas versus the rest of the U.S., which has been taken over by this insane sort of CCP dominated, big tech owned criminal conspiracy. Who's going to win? Well, you know, I, I think back to the naive me of 20 years ago who would have thought, well, freedom will always win out. Yeah, yeah it, right. It burns in the hearts of all Americans and all this. <laughs> it's written, no. And, and I remember, I remember in the debates between Biden and Trump, there was a moment in which Trump said, people want to be free. And Biden said, people want to be safe. And I thought that sums it up. That argument right there is what this is all about. Mm. And the thing is, they were safe. That's the thing. I mean, you already are, unless you're in a nursing home, almost half the deaths from this in the U.S. have occurred in nursing homes, which is a place where the average person has a life expectancy of 18 months to begin with, even under ideal conditions. So most people were safe to begin with. I have several cases of, of children, high school age kids, my daughter knows, who were not allowed to go out and socialize for the past 14 months. They were at zero risk and, I mean, you know, essentially zero risk, and they were not allowed to go, even though they, they could drive to different places, they could drive to see their grandmother once in a while or to see, well, whoever, the driving in the car is far more dangerous to them. Sure. No, no one even stops to think this. And- I, I don't know what to tell my daughter. We're just marveling that this could have been done to kids, that there are parents, even in Florida, where you, know, where you do have access to a governor who's going to tell you the truth, they still did this to kids. Yeah. And also, 14 months to a child is the equivalent of 14 years to an adult. Yes. I mean, time, their development is really important. To, to be denied human contact, peer group contact, yeah, it's Terrible. awful. But the things they missed out on, the irreplaceable, joyful moments that everyone else was allowed to have. And I, I feel like older folks should have stood up more and said, look, when I was a kid, I was allowed to go to my prom and I was allowed to have all these wonderful, irreplaceable memories. And I'm not going to be such a selfish SOB as to say, well, to keep me safe, even though none of these measures seem to do anything anyway, you have to be arbitrarily deprived of everything that gives you joy. And, and I think I, I don't remember if I did, said this when you were on my show, but I came to the conclusion that the rule of thumb that the public health establishment is following, it, it's, it's not really science. It's just a rule of thumb, which is if there's something out there that gives people joy and happiness, we should probably restrict or cancel that. And if there's something by contrast that if we introduced it, it would lead to great inconvenience and pain, mm. we should probably do that. And that explains what they're doing far more than uh, mitigation measures or whatever. It's just, and I was just t talking the other day, I, I was in uh, the dermatologist office. So these people are, these are medical professionals. Mm. And up at the desk where you sign in, they have two little cups and they each have pens in them. And one says sanitized and one says used. So you take the pen, you write your signature and you put it in the used one. So they're, even at this stage, Medical professionals are spreading the idea that the virus spreads through pens, that if you sign your name, you're probably going to give somebody COVID. Now, even our CDC, which has been, I don't want to say it's been medieval because that is an insult to the Middle Ages. They weren't yeah. that superstitious. Uh, the, even they've said, look, it's not spreading through surfaces, really. All this deep cleaning is almost surely unnecessary. And yet 14 months in, my doctor's office is telling me that it might spread from a pen I mean, what is, I mean, again, well, that would make anyone into a conspiracy theorist. What can account for this? Yeah. These are the highly educated scientific people, and, and they're still pushing ridiculous childish nonsense like this? I would have been so tempted to go in there and reach into the used pen and sort of suck the pen. Except I suppose if it's a, der <laughs> if it's a dermatologist, you might catch leprosy or something, mightn't you? So maybe, maybe not, or, or I don't know 
something bad. But probably nothing as bad as you'd get from having the COVID vaccine. I mean, have you seen some of those pictures of people's kind of legs turning like a leopard, you know, horrible spots and everything? Really bad well, thing. Then what they'll say is, uh, well, I, I, you know, I don't need to tell you what they'll say. They'll say, well, these are very rare and, and uh, you know, and, and the risk of COVID is much worse. But for me, I don't feel like it is. I mean, I'm, I'm not the youngest person in the world, I'll grant you, but I'm not in a nursing home either. And I'm in good health. I, I take care of myself and I don't have any comorbidities. So I, I, I think I'm going to be okay. And, and, and they asked the, uh, you know, when, see, our CDC made this interesting move recently, I'm sure you know, where they said vaccinated people can do all these things. Like they can, they suddenly said, after telling us that you still need to mask and social distance, all of a sudden we got, well, actually, you can go completely back to your pre pandemic life. But if, you're, but if you don't have the vaccine, then you still have to mask and social distance and all that. But then somebody asked the question, all right, well, how can I tell the difference between a vaccinated person and an unvaccinated person? I'm vaccinated, but I, you know, how do I know if I'm hanging around with an unvaccinated person? And the, even the CDC came back with, well, if you're vaccinated, you're protected. It's only the unvaccinated who needs to worry. So you shouldn't worry about this. Uh, but that's not been the way um, people have, have been acting. They, they act like... If every single solitary soul isn't vaccinated, I am personally in danger. Yes. You are not personally in danger from my decision not to vaccinate. And, and, and incidentally, Thomas Massey, who's a U.S. congressman here, who also had COVID, he's, he says he's declining the vaccine. Uh, he was pointing out the, the newspaper headlines about Senator Rand Paul, who says he's not, he ha also had COVID, so he's not going to get the vaccine. He says, notice the completely inappropriate word they use in the headline, editorializing word, refuses the vaccine, when the correct impartial word is declines the vaccine. Yes, good point. Yeah. Tell me, because um, I haven't had enough American guests on recently, is there any likelihood that states like Florida and, the, and Texas will secede? I mean, Given how bad the situation, given your Supreme Court is is over, it won't do the job of of the, the Supreme Court was supposed to do. It wouldn't acknowledge the stolen election. It wouldn't. Yeah, you know, I mean, you 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 you've had a, a coup. Would you, would you agree with me? Uh, th there has been a coup in America. Are you with me on that, or is that too extreme? I I, I just don't know enough to to know for sure. Okay, I, I I can't say I would rule it out because I'm dealing with people who thought absolutely nothing of murdering a ton of Iraqis on the basis of nothing. Yeah. So I cannot rule anything out that they would do, but I don't, I don't know the evidence. Okay, fine. Fair enough. But okay. My secession question, is it, is it going to happen? Could it happen? Well, first of all, it could happen. Uh, I mean, I, I think we can say that there have been more surprising things in history than that. Okay. Uh, secondly, there are excellent, I, I, we won't get, we do this in another episode, but um, there are excellent constitutional arguments in favor of secession. Now the Supreme court declared in 1869 just through its own ipsa dixit that, uh, that that you can't secede, but it made no arguments. The, the, the arguments are entirely on the side of, I mean, for heaven's sake, the U.S. Constitution refers to the United States in the plural repeatedly to emphasize that it's not a modern state like other, like France or other places in the world, but it's a collection of states. It's a collection of, of societies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I absolutely believe in the right of secession. Now, the question is, Secession is a toxic word in the United States because everyone associates with, associates it with slavery. But as you know, logically, there's no connection between uh, slavery and secession. That doesn't have to be. I mean, the, there were Soviet republics that seceded, and that had nothing to do with slavery. Norway and Sweden had nothing to do with slavery. There's nothing necessarily to do with slavery when one body withdraws from another mm. in, in order to enhance its own self-government. The, the issue is most Americans – or let's say a lot of Americans seem incapable of entertaining an idea that is not approved for them by the New York Times. And this idea is demonized. This would be considered crazy because the New York Times has told us that the sorts of things we can debate are whether the top federal income tax rate should be 39.8 or 40.7%, like that kind of debate we can have. But whether we should continue as one country when it's obviously dysfunctional and you obviously have people with completely irreconcilable worldviews stuck in it, fighting with each other all the time, it would seem like the sensible approach is to have a peaceful separation. 
But that is not, it doesn't matter how sensible it is. It's not approved. And we, all these people wearing masks outdoors are desperate for approval. Right. So it would have to get really, really bad for them to be willing to entertain uh, an unapproved thought like that. But it could, it could get that bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the grass is always blacker. Um, I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I look across uh, at America. I mean, when I'm not looking enviously at Texas and, and, and Florida, and I'm thinking, your, your president is just a disaster. And his, his soon to be successor is even more disaster. I mean, you know, give me senility anytime over the kind of yeah. hard left of Kamala. Um, it, it's, it's like the American economy is being dismantled. I mean, you're, the, the money printing that has gone on, the, 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 and the spending, the government spending, I mean, it's in trillions now, isn't it? And these are mainly boondoggles to benefit the, the DC class. It's, it's all going to get siphoned off into their, into their bank accounts. So America is like a kind of kleptocracy run by, well, have I said enough? I mean, yeah. um, I would, if, if I were with somebody like you and that I'm living in a free state like, like Florida, I'd be wanting to, to get away from that as much as possible. Uh, well, to, to get away from from what exactly? Well, the, the entity that is that, that is a, a a federal system controlled from oh, Washington. Oh, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Oh no, it's no. Believe me, I favor the secession. I favor this yeah. absolutely. I just, but I I'm just saying that unfortunately, um, the S word for for most people is just not on their radar. However, when Trump was elected, all of a sudden, some left liberals were willing to entertain the prospect of California secession. Right. So they don't have any principles. It's not a matter of we should encourage self-government. It's if I'm unhappy, I should be able to see, oh, that, sure. gee, that's a great way to live. Um, so, yeah, of course, I, I absolutely favor it, and I want to encourage it at every possible turn. I want to normalize the use of the word yeah. secession uh, so that we can – because until we can start using the word, we can't, we can't process the idea. Uh, but, but incidentally, this Harris, you know, at least Hillary Clinton, you got the impression that she was smart. And this is one of my friends put it this way. She, she was smart, but mean. Yeah. Whereas with Kamala, you get the impression she's dumb, but mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every unlikable quality, which is why she was a huge failure. This has been forgotten. She was a huge failure in the Democratic primary uh, races. She barely registered in the polls at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had no support whatsoever. She would almost certainly be, if she became president uh, during the Biden term, she would have to be by far the least popular person ever to become president. So we have that going for us. Yeah, yeah, you do. What about when they come for your guns? I mean, the, the, just just explain something to me. How how sort of inviolate is, say, Florida? How how much power has DeSantis to keep Florida a kind of mask-free, uh, vaccine-free? Uh, gun celebrating territory, and how? What what ability to, does does the uh, DC have to screw you over and 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 just crush you? Well, they don't follow any rules, so it's not as if we can say, well, constitutionally they can't do X. That hasn't stopped them. But the fact that DeSantis and Abbott and others have gotten away with what they've gotten away with does still say something, even for an old cynic like me about the resilience of the U.S. federal system, that they've been mm. able to do it. Now, what really matters is not what's written on paper, whether you know the Constitution limits the federal government, this and that, because obviously these people don't care about a piece of paper. Right. What matters is what will the public let them get away with? So people ask me, can the governor do so-and-so? I'd say, well, yes, he can. But the question is, who, wh who, which side do most people support? If, if, if most people support the governor, it would be very, very hard. Like, for example, the sheriff, this is not well known outside the U.S., but the sheriff, the local sheriff has an enormous amount of authority. If he says he's not enforcing something in his area, then, then that's just, that's the end. It goes unenforced. And now, yes, the U.S. president could intervene and, and amass troops and send them into that area. But the thing is, Democrat or Republican in general, everybody loves the local sheriff in the U.S. Right. So you would be expending an enormous amount of political capital against a population that despises you. Yeah. So on the local level and on the state level, 
uh, the governors and the sheriffs have a tremendous amount of power, but because the the U.S. government is untethered from the Constitution, it's it's possible that they could just say, "Well, we're we're rolling in the tanks." But it's a little hard for them to lecture the world on democracy when they're rolling in tanks against their own people. Yeah. So the, the question becomes: Can I afford to expend all this political capital in this campaign against DeSantis? I mean, I think he's I think he's going to come out. Okay, like they 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 raise the prospect of travel restrictions to Florida. They raise that prospect, and then they denied it, which means they were considering it. Yes, of course. And DeSantis stood up and said, "We will absolutely not allow that. There will be free commerce and tra- and travel going in and out of Florida, no matter what they say." I think there would have been enough people in Florida backing him that they would indeed have backed down. And indeed, well, what happened? They did back down. That's I'm I'm so glad that that fighting spirit is there in America. I mean, it's it's, it's you know you you I imagine you you get taught this in your history classes, don't you? You learn all about the the Minutemen and and stuff fighting the the British colonial oppressors or whatever, however you like to. Yeah. And that's in your that's in your DNA and and the right to bear arms and having your well ordered militia and stuff. I, I mean, that's that's all that stands between you, I think, and and oppression like we're getting over here. Well, uh, we need a lot more of it. We need it to be revived and and encouraged instead of demonized. Because if you talk like that, if you talk too much about the American War for Independence and that great fighting spirit, you know, hey, that's that's domestic terrorist talk, man. You better be careful. It's it, it, there. There is a lot of madness and craziness here, even still. But honestly, I think this is the place I would most want to be right now. I mean, yeah, I know Belarus did not uh, really lock down and. You know, um, I know the same thing was true of uh, Nicaragua. They didn't really lock down, but I don't want to live in Nicaragua. And I want to live in Belarus. I want to live in a, an English-speaking country uh, that, where I have some connection with the history. So I'm staying here, uh, and I, I don't see there's any anything better. Yeah. I can't believe that my wife is still not answering, answering the call, which is for her, after all. I know it. I know who it is. It's just so annoying. It's the... Oh. Stop it. It's now asking me to set up professional audio. Yeah, that is the thing, isn't it? It's not just what limited place in the world that you can find that is not where you're not going to be um, face Armageddon. It's also where you'd actually bear to live. People, I've got friends in Florida who send me, the, who troll me with these photographs, of these, these little short films they've made of people sitting outside in cafes, not in masks. It's awful. I mean, to watch. It's... I, I, but what, what I don't understand are all the Europeans who continue to be worried about the Indian variant or this and that, and they're still consenting to all these lockdowns and shaming people who don't like them. Are they just acting as if Florida doesn't exist? Or I, I hope they're not trying to pretend that's all because of the vaccines, because that this, is... this, this started months and months and months and months ago where we were doing stuff like this. I mean, the Super Bowl was way before yeah. hardly anyone was vaccinated. And there, there, was no, there was no super spreader as a result of the Super Bowl. How are they, are they just pretending this isn't happening? I tell you what, um, Tom, it's, 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 it's been one of the, the most bizarre experiences of my life. Looking around and looking at people who were, people who were at university with me, for example, people who were supposed to be the creme de la creme, the intellectual elite of this country. And they can't answer basic questions like, given that hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin stop you dying of COVID and just, be, and just make it like any other survivable, you know, like a, like a nasty cold. Given that that is the case, why are we forcing people to take these, these vaccines with a much dodgier uh, safety records that, that, that haven't even come out of their experimental phase yet? Also, if masks and, and quarantines are so important, how come Florida and Texas and South Dakota seem to have, have done perfectly okay? These are questions which are not being answered and they ought to be answered because, I mean, how can you justify doing all the terrible things, all the freedom sapping things, the life destroying things they're doing if you can't answer these basic questions? Which- exactly. And if, if, if I can jump in here, I want to give you three examples when the, the establishment here has been asked those questions because once in a while they do get asked about that. Hmm. And as I've said before, there have been times when I've thought deep down, well, maybe Fauci is smart enough that if I asked him why is you know Texas doing fine after reopening, maybe he has some very sophisticated answer 
that would be convincing. You know, I mean, he is a great expert in everything, so maybe. But then when they actually do ask him and you hear his answer, you realize, oh my gosh, they have no idea. They have no idea what's going on. So for example, they, they did ask Fauci that. Why is Texas doing so well? We all predicted disaster and they're doing fine. And his answer was, I don't really know. Perhaps they're doing a lot of things outdoors. I'm not kidding you. That was his answer. And apparently the American media is perfectly satisfied with that nonsensical answer. So then uh, another example, Andy Slavitt, who is one of the great panickers who uh, advises the White House, he was asked on MSNBC, which for your, in case you guys over there don't know, is the most left liberal network we've yes, got. No, we. But even they asked, well, look, California and Florida are comparable, and they're especially comparable when you do, when you correct for age. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet California has been very locked down and Florida hasn't. And so you think, all right, well, let's hear how is Slavitt going to explain this? And his answer was, there are some things about this virus that are a bit beyond our understanding. Right. So, so they admit they don't get it. And then he goes on to say, but listen, here's what we know works. Social distancing and whatever, lockdown, whatever. But, but wait a minute. Well, obviously, we don't know that works because you just got done saying, you yourself just got done saying, you don't know how to explain why California would be doing so poorly when it should be doing great, according to you. Yeah. And then finally, so let's see, who is, so we did Slavitt and Fauci. And then Michael Osterholm is another expert. And he really is an expert on influenza. He's been studying it for 40 years. So then they asked uh, Osterholm about this. He predicted that Florida would be a, a house on fire. He predicted this in October, a house on fire within X number of weeks. And of course, everything continued to improve in Florida. Uh, in early January, he said the next six to 14 weeks are going to be the worst of the pandemic. After 14 weeks passed, the case numbers had fallen 76%. <laughs> They still listen to this guy. They don't ask him, why are you wrong all the time? Yeah. But he did have the honesty to say, look, there is no reason that Iowa, fully open, should be doing so much better than Michigan, heavily locked down. He said this a few weeks ago uh, on, on Twitter. He said, I, and anybody who says he has an explanation for that is lying to you. So what I respected about that, and I hate to use the word respect in the same sentence with these people, was that he had the honesty to say, we don't fully get it. Okay, because... If it really is true that staying isolated, this should, you know, get the R not figure down, whatever, then this shouldn't be happening. And yet it is. Yeah. So we clearly don't fully get it. And that, James, that is what I've been asking them to say from the beginning is just be honest with us, level with us and say, we don't fully understand this thing. I mean, yeah, they give lip service to that. They'll say, well, we don't, you know, there are aspects of it we don't get. No, 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 no. I need to be, I need you to be much more straightforward with me. We do not understand how this thing works because the things we're recommending don't seem to make any difference. And Osterholm is now more or less admitting that. Yeah, yeah. Tom, I, I think, look, you're so good at this, this shit that I think we should do another podcast sometime. But I wanted to ask you, if you're up for it, of course, um, yeah. I wanted to ask you um, a point we, did, we never followed up at the beginning. Who are the, who are the big beasts that you, 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 you feel incapable of getting on because you're not famous enough? Who would you like? Who would you? Oh, well, let's see. I mean, well, obviously, I'd like to get Trump on and ask him questions. Um, do you think I'd he'd be good? I do because there are things I want to tell him. Yeah, you know, and 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 or I want to see. Looking back on it now, and assuming you're not getting back into politics, so you can even admit you made a mistake. Do you think it was wrong to do the 15 days to flatten the curve? You know, like I just like to get his yeah, thoughts yeah. on it. Yeah. Like, do you really, in your, in your heart of hearts, now do you think it saved lives? Stuff like that. I'd like to get Scott Atlas on. Now, yeah. I don't know if that's a name familiar. No, with yeah, him. no, he'd be great. Yeah. I'd, and and I, I don't think that's impossible because he's writing a book. No, you you, was, you get him, definitely. Okay, well, I, I mean, I, we, we have some of the same friends, which helps. Because I was asking one of his colleagues, I said, you got to tell Scott Atlas. He needs to write a tell-all book naming names about mm. what happened in the Trump White House and who did what and who was backstabbing whom. And, and he said, well, I'm happy to tell you, he's already writing it and yeah. it's going to be great. And, and by the way, that's important because to have a book that will exist forever, be accessible forever, will help to tell the real story a hundred years from now. Of course. So people can look and see, well, maybe it wasn't just they all social distanced and the thing went away. Maybe there was more to it than that. Yeah. Just going back to that Trump thing, I had a debate on my Telegram group about this this question. You know, a lot of, a lot of people are disappointed in in Trump. They 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 thought he had a plan. They they hoped that 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 
he was going to be our he, he was going to be our savior and people are quite bitter about that but i think one of the things they're bitter about is is that he did not now who, who said this peter mcculloch have you have you seen the interview of peter mcculloch the well i've seen him i don't know if it's the interview but i've heard him speak okay so peter mcculloch says um that trump really should have pushed hydroxychloroquine harder uh you know i mean obviously he did he said it you know, became known as the trump drug but he really should have fought fauci ha- harder because fauci is clearly as you recognized he's cabal he's a bit he's he's a bad lot why did trump allow himself but then other people have countered well trump was a kind of prisoner of his medical establishment he couldn't be and, and I, I don't know what the answer is do you have a view on that well i you know i i i, I just hate being told about well the president is hemmed in and he can't do they never say that about a left-wing president. He does whatever he wants. He doesn't care. Yeah. He'll fire anybody who needs to be fired. And what he wants to happen will happen. Yeah. It's only people who are at least nominally on our side. We have to be get these all these excuses about why they couldn't do the things that we obviously know they needed to do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sympathetic to that line of argument. What I think he should have done is had a series of nationally te- – well, of course, you can't guarantee that the network's going to carry them. But he should have produced roundtables with – Koldorf, Bhattacharya, and, and Scott Atlas and others, where they showed some of the charts I'm trying to show on my yes. website, and where they review what's actually happening in a non-panicky way, and where they say, yeah, they had summer camps like normal in such and such state, and nothing happened. There's no piles of dead kids. There's no piles of dead camp counselors. None of these things happened. That should have been coming out all the time, because instead, all we got was panic, 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 panic. And he could have done that. He could have highlighted scientists who were defying the established narrative much, much more than he did. I think you're so right. I think you're so right. For example, you're right. It wouldn't have been covered in the MSM, but it would have, would have enabled organizations like Breitbart, for example, to have covered this as, as pure news without fear of being having hanging over them the threat of being canceled by, by, you know, by the various big tech companies, which is what, you know, they're, they're constantly after conservative media. But that would be, yeah, Trump should have used his cachet to get the message out, shouldn't he? I, because I felt like those of us who were trying to get the message out were just, again, disorganized and scattered. And he's got the White House, for heaven's sake. Yes. He should be in the, you know, in, in the, the Rose Garden or wherever. Yeah. He should have Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford on. Yeah. He should he should zoom in with Sunitra Gupta, who is a female scientist of color from outside the U.S. That covers almost all bases. I mean, all she needs to do is be paralyzed, and she'd cover everything, right? Yeah. He, he should have been doing that uh, because you cannot you cannot question the credentials of those people. Yeah, no. you just can't. I think you're right. I, I think you've actually sorted that one out. Yeah, and Trump would be would, would be a good get for your show. I I, I hope he comes on it. Um, Tom. Yeah, I mean, I, I highly, do, you know, I don't think I could do, but that's what I mean about people. You know, he would, it, it's conceivable that a Joe Rogan could get him. It's conceivable that he would do it. It's conceivable that Sean Hannity could get him. It's not conceivable that I could. So I guess it's people like that, or maybe, um, yeah, I'm trying to, th- I mean, I, I want, there's a guy named Mike Rowe in the United States and he has a show. He used to have a show called Dirty Jobs and it would show him for a day doing a job that somebody has to do every day and it's filthy and awful and it would be an interesting show. But since then he's become really well known as somebody who believes in individual responsibility and not demanding government assistance and this and that. He's very sound on that. He's been very, very good on the pandemic and he has a huge, huge fan base, but he's hard to get. Is he? Or, or Van Morrison. I want to get Van Morrison on my show. And I was told, and, and I, by the way, I think this is correct. I was told, I, I wrote to his publicist, because, of course, Van Morrison has written anti-lockdown songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to get him on the show. And I was told he's not doing interviews. This was, this was probably four or five months ago, before, or even longer, actually, before. It was just as the songs were coming out. I was told he's not doing interviews. And, and sure enough, I, I scoured YouTube and everything. I couldn't find a single interview he had done. So I, may, that may not have been a case of, I'm such a small potato that he may genuinely not have been doing that. But, but if not, why not talk about a missed opportunity, get on TV, be interviewed about this. If you're going to be outspoken, be outspoken. 
Well, it's funny, isn't it? I, there are, there's, a, there's a handful of, of rock stars who've come out against the nonsense. You've got Eric Clapton, yep. who again probably wouldn't do an interview. I mean, he's quite shy, isn't he? So yeah. Eric Clapton, Van Morrison, Morrissey yep. would, be, would be great if you get him, but he's, he's quite slippery. Um, do you know, are you familiar with the Stone Roses, Ian Brown? Oh, no, I'm not. Do, do, do they not get big in America? Well, they Around might be, but I, I 1989, tend to be... 90, you, you were your child, so you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't remember. <laughs> well, I'm 48. Yeah. Okay. So, so well, you, yeah, you, 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 you are the right generation to be familiar with him. But again, he's been absolutely outspoken, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to give interviews. He doesn't want to, they, they just, they're musicians. They want to do their music thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I want. I want to get Thomas Sowell is 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 one is on my my dream list. I yeah. So I almost got him. I got the. Um, they sent me his, a free copy of his book, which mm. usually means he's going to come on. Why else would they send me the book? And then it just never happened. And and thing is, I know his work inside and out. I love him. I could have that could have been an outstanding interview, but just because of how how well I've I've read. I haven't just read two of his newspaper columns, so that was disappointing. But he was already in his eighties by the time we reached out to him. Yeah, he's but he's so wise, isn't he? He's kind of he's kind of my economics god. I mean, basic economics is just so good. And and not but not to mention just no matter what the subject is, as a writer, he's top notch. Yeah. You know, I I would love to be as good as he is. He's a top notch writer. Yeah, clear and devastating. I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of Thomas Sowell. No. I wouldn't want him to be critiquing my book or something. Oh, you'd get. You'd get eaten alive. Well, laid alive, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do. I won't get him, but I do hope you get him. You do. Is there still a chance? Well, I kind of dropped the idea. I, mean, I suppose I could take it up again. I think you should. I think I think you'd be do a better job than I would because you you, you know you know your economic stuff more than I do. But yeah, that would be great. Look, please come back on the show. Um, and um, if, if you've, uh, dear listeners, if you've enjoyed this, don't forget to support me on on Patreon or Subscribe Star or uh, yeah, um, I'm really bad at at plugging and monetizing my content. Uh, you, I should have uh, next time I'll ask you for tips on that, Tom, because I think you're, you're 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 more you've got your head screwed on more than I have. I, I actually am pretty decent when it comes to that, but I, I will I will say just uh, flat out here that I support you on Patreon, and I don't support that many people content creators. Uh, well, I support some, I suppose, but given how many of them there are out there, it's a very, very tiny percentage I support, but it was because of your Heather McDonald interview. It was, it was fearless and it was things that can't be denied, but that are denied. And I just thought to myself, anybody who could conduct an interview like that deserves support. That was the yes. entirety. You didn't need to market it to me. It was somebody like that. It's just a matter of fairness. Somebody's doing that kind of work. You should support him. Oh, that's good. Well, thank you for that that endorsement. <laughs> that's really good. Tom, great to have you on the show. And um, yeah, let's do it again. Thank you, James. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, a couple things. First, tomorrow, our old friend Mark Skousen will join us once again. He is the editor of Forecasts and Strategies, which is a financial newsletter he's published for 41 years. And I'm going to ask him some kind of basic entry-level questions about investing, but we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things and say a little something about Freedom Fest in uh, South Dakota. If you're thinking about going, I'm going to have a whole day, the Tom Woods Day, which is the Saturday of Freedom Fest, where we're going to have some terrific panels on some great topics. And it's going to be, I'm going to be there from Wednesday night onward. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you're an outdoors sort of person, it's a wonderful place to vacation. So Definitely consider it. And if you're thinking of going, you can take $50 off as a Tom Woods Show listener. Freedomfest.com, use coupon code WOODS50, and you get $50 off. So that's a nice thing to know. And the other thing I want to mention is, of course, not to forget the key event of the year. As great as Freedom Fest is, well, I'm afraid the libertarian event of the year is still the Tom Woods Show 2000th episode event in Orlando. And you should definitely go to that. So check that out. We're going to have some of your favorites from the Tom Woods show on there, including Michael Malice, who says he's got a special surprise guest. Who I do not know who it is, who is just going to knock everybody's socks off. So between Malice and Angela McArdle and Bob Murphy and Eric July and, and a lot of your 
favorites and regulars from the Tom Woods Show, you're just going to have a tremendous time. And we're going to give you a whole evening's worth of entertainment and socializing. And you're going to be surrounded by friends you haven't met yet. So the details for that event are at TomWoods2000.com. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.